why are there so many diseases without a cure? Even after billions of dollars of investment by big pharma and governments all across the world, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and of course the big C, cancer. They're all diseases without a definitive cure. This is not some big conspiracy. Take it from me. My name is Jack, a scientist and college professor who studied and worked in the molecular biosciences for over two decades. There are three main reasons for the slow progress of innovation in this area, and reason three is the human touch. How hard the experiments are to physically perform. The entry point for laboratory training is pipetting, moving liquid to and from different tubes, bottles, and flasks, which relies on dexterity and your hand-eye coordination. This takes skill and practice, which we get to by first visualizing good pipetting technique. You can see my video on pipetting here. What counts as good technique really? In drug discovery, we are working with tiny volumes, microliters and nanoliters of liquid. If you say completely screwed up your pipetting, pipetting one microliter instead of 0.2, 0 0.2 microliters, which is literally five times higher in the dosage of drugs, a difference that may very well kill a patient in hospital. It's almost impossible to see with the untrained eye. What's easy to focus on is how to avoid mistake five, contamination. Unknowingly touching the pipette tip on different surfaces, your hands, the bench top, which will add dust, bacteria, or unwanted chemicals into your mixture. It doesn't matter how careful you are drawing up or dispensing liquid. The contaminated pipette tip will alter what is inside your tube and ruin your experiment. This does take a lot of training to always keep track of where your pipette is pointing and what your pipette tip has touched, but you can ask a more experienced lab tech to watch you as you pipette or even just film yourself pipetting over a 10 minute period, let's say. Set up your phone camera at the level of the bench top different to your normal point of view and watch the footage back. How many times did your pipette touch something it shouldn't have? There are no easy shortcuts here. It just takes practice, which will also help with mistake four, improper mix up. If you are giving a patient an intravenous dosage of drugs, those drugs need to enter their bloodstream and circulate throughout most of their body, if not their whole body, before taking effect. If we want to simulate that process in our experiments, you have to make sure that any drugs or liquid you add to a tube or flask of cells is properly mixed. Think about when you're adding food dye to make icing for a cake. Until you mix it through thoroughly, the color of the icing will be dark in some parts of the bowl and completely white and uncolored in others. It's not until you mix it all the way through homogeneously that the icing will then change into a uniform shade. If you don't mix samples properly, some parts of your tube will contain more of the chemical or drug than the other parts of the tube. And when you then try and draw up liquid from that tube, how much drug is in your pipette tip is a complete coin toss. Mixing properly can be as simple as tapping the side of the tube or vortexing before you drop any liquid with your pipette. It may slow your experiment down in the moment, but it short beats having to repeat the experiment from scratch. Speaking of slow, reason two for why it's so hard to find cures for diseases, following footsteps. We can't rely on a single well-trained scientist to do every experiment in the world, and naturally there will be variability from person to person. There are tens of thousands of scientists all across the world doing similar experiments every single day, but it's not always clear if everyone is on the same page or using exactly the same technique. The best example of this is the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology, which tried to repeat 50 experiments from 23 high-profile cancer research articles. All of this work has been vetted and published in prestigious journals, so we should be able to build on top of this work to make the next breakthrough. Right, not quite, because only 46% of these experimental findings could be independently reproduced, less than half. Scientists may be working on different cell lines, using a different batch of the drug, or working with more sensitive equipment to make their readings. This is not to say they can't be trusted, and again, this is not a conspiracy, but it does take a lot of extra work to translate the findings from lab experiments of patients in hospitals. Speaking of extra work, I write a weekly newsletter on science, tech, and productivity, crossover connections, and also produce the Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne podcast to talk about the latest science news headlines. All the links are in the description below, along with my website, jackwayne.com.au. With that out of the way, let's come back to the third most common mistake in pipetting, the need for speed. Have you ever been on a bus where it feels herky-jerky for the whole ride? Very stop and start with vast minute breaks and unpredictable acceleration, and you end up feeling dizzy and sick if not throwing up after the ride. The same thing that's happening to you, moving back and forth in response to the driver's sudden pedal movements, will happen to the liquid in your pipette. If you do not move the plunger 
with steady and smooth transitions of speed. If you suddenly draw up the plunger too quickly and not hold the pet still when immersed in the liquid, you will likely suck up just as much air as liquid into the pipette tip. If you push down on the plunger too aggressively, odds are it will be more forceful at the beginning of the push and not the same force or pressure towards the end. This inconsistent speed in pressing the plunger will not only make the volume less accurate over time, you will also tie your hands out more quickly, both of which directly lead to the second most common pipetting mistake, mistake two, bubble, toil, and trouble. The bane of any scientist's existence, bubbles. No bubble is the same size. They're taking up volume in your bottle, flask, or pipette. The more bubbles there are, the less accurate everything turns out to be. Bubbles don't form for any one specific reason, but let's go through a quick bubble elimination checklist. One, are you using the right size pipette tip and does it fit snugly on the end of your pipette? If it's too big, it won't form a tight seal. Then you're introducing air as you move the plunger. Two, is the liquid you're trying to pipette very thick or viscous? Is it closer to tap water or egg white in consistency? Does it contain chemicals that are likely to foam, say a detergent like SDS? The more viscous and more likely to foam your liquid is, the gentler you'll need to be when moving the plunger of your pipette. Three, are you pushing down on the plunger too quickly and too suddenly or aggressively? Slow, steady, and smooth wins the race here. Four, are you holding the pipette at a 45 degree angle as you're drawing up or aspirating the liquid? Five, have you primed your pipette tip in the liquid before aspirating? Try to draw up and dispense the liquid one or two times before your real attempt, making sure that every attempt is at a 45 degree angle and that you're slow, smooth, and steady every single time. The pipette should be completely filled with liquid without any air bubbles, and this gives you the confidence that your final real pipetting attempt will give you the most accurate result. Bubbles are the second most common pipetting mistake. The number one most common pipetting mistake I've seen after teaching 100,000 science students over the past decade is... Wait, before we get there, the main reason, the number one reason why finding cures for biological diseases is slower than we'd like is the double-edged sword. It is my honest belief that no three words have damaged the relationship between scientists and the general public more than cure for cancer. Global warming vaccine mandate come a close second and third, but cancer is not one disease with a singular cure. It is conservatively at least a hundred different diseases, each of which we have made great strides and tremendous progress in novel treatment strategies. But there still is no pill that will magically kill all of the cancer cells in our bodies. We are diverse by design. Our DNA is not 100% the same as our parents. There is always a last minute recombination to mix it up and make sure we're all just that little bit different at the genetic level. There could be a catastrophic global event, say a completely fictitious infectious disease that affects everyone in the world. In this completely hypothetical scenario, it's a huge advantage that our DNA is different to each other, even by a little bit, so that some of us at least may be able to fight off the infection better than others. While this is not a bug, but instead a feature to help our species survive as a whole. Genetic diversity is a double-edged sword for cancer. Cancer can be the result of a mutation in any number of our genes. These spread out across different organs and progress and deteriorate at different rates in different people. Clinical trials for new cancer therapies are very lucky to recruit a few hundred patients, but this of course does not capture the full biological diversity of the human race, let alone all the ways cancer can manifest. This work is slow and difficult, but we have to personalize severe in order to capture the full spectrum of any biological disease in order to then find new treatments if not an outright cure. And we need to focus on what we can control. Some days it's as simple as getting the smallest step right. Which brings me to the number one most commonly made pipetting mistake. It's not your fault. This one is as advertised, literally not your fault. Not directly anyway. Your pipette may be misaligned, miscalibrated, but you may have played a part in it of course. But pipettes are a tool. It's a poor craftsman that blames their tools. But you do need a system to regularly check and maintain the accuracy of these pipettes. They are stripped apart, cleaned and put back together after careful calibration. As good as you ready for the next experiment. And if you're interested in how pipetting can be used in one of the most common biological experiments, polymerase chain reaction or PCR, that video is linked here. I'm Jack. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time around.